Okay, so why don't we take um, just a couple of minutes uh, for questions um, for um, Matt Trowbridge. Yes. Sir. And yeah, yeah. use a mic, uh, actually, since we're broadcasting, webcasting. Dr. Trowbridge, would you spell out a little bit more the the metrics that you're talking about in the very last slide? Because they seem to me to be, until we develop those, it's going to be hard to push them, to insist on them, to credit them, to judge the eff effectiveness of them. So I'd, I'd be interested in a little more detail there. Well, absolutely. Um, and obviously, that is a um, a, long, a big conversation. Um, I, I think what I, what I want to make sure uh, you guys understand is that I, I personally, we're, no one is sitting off quietly with a secret set of the perfect health and wellness metrics for the real estate industry at this moment. So, um, and I'm not claiming to have them either at this exact moment. What we did in the health affairs article, because and I was very honest with the health affairs when they asked me to write that, I said, what I'm willing to do is to try to write down what I feel are a set of uh, performance criteria, essentially, that I think uh, hopefully challenge particularly public health and healthcare um, policymakers, researchers, uh, to think a little bit about what are the types, what are the uh, attributes of health and wellness metrics that are that the real estate industry net needs to make them useful and actionable. And so um, that's actually some of the some of the criteria are things like um, making sure that they are actionable. We don't always necessarily deliver metrics like that in public health. They need to be mutable. In other words, they need to, the, the actual developer or the architect has to have a, a, a chance or feel empowered that they could actually make a difference, they could actually shift the metrics that you're handing to them. Sometimes we give them county scale, you know, we, oh, no developer wants to be on the hook for changing obesity rates at their county level with their one building. Uh, but, but so we have to figure out how to get them down to a scale that they can deal with. Um, and I'm tired at the end of the day, so give me a second. Um, we are, uh, so actionable, mutable. Um, I'm sorry? Sure, uh, well, absolutely. Uh, well, practical is a key thing. The, um, and what we mean by that is, um, you know, I think we tend to forget that it is, uh, the infrastructure to, to gather data, uh, surveys, things it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's also not a core competency of a lot of folks in real estate. So I think um, focusing on any opportunity we can to utilize you know, things like uh, the data coming off of these things. Uh, I think there's gonna be a need to be a new science, uh, a, a new, think a lot of thinking on how to utilize the pros and cons of crowdsourced data and things like that, but with a focus on making those data easier for a developer to, to gather. And then obviously valuable, but that word is loaded. Um, you know, it needs to be valuable in the sense of being relevant to the investors and so forth, but I also think a really key point that I try to make um, is that um, whatever, Whatever we uh, decide those measures are going to be will, will ultimately be what we get. <laughs> and um, the train, I think the industry has decided, you know, one aside that I've, noted, I've learned is green building has essentially been successful enough that it's kind of put itself out of business a little bit. Um, green building is now more standard building. And so um, a big part of the success of green building has been um, in creating an opportunity for competitive differentiation projects. So uh, health and wellness is really rapidly emerging as the new potential competitive differentiation. And I think that's something we have to A, leverage, but also B, recognize that this industry is moving out of the station. They are going to go for that. So we have to move fairly quickly. So anyway, those are, um, there's no way to make that short. I hope that that was enough, but I, I'd appreciate, please read the article and if you have thoughts, we would love to hear them. Thanks. Uh, could we post it on the web page? Are we? I mean, if it is it, I, well, we, we have a, we, we have open access links and so Great. forth. Great. So that we'll we'll do that. Okay. Matt, thank you uh, very much. Uh, a nice book appeared from MIT last December. In it, they said 
there is no silver bullet for healthy communities. And they refused to, they said, you know, there's really not enough proof. And Howie Frumkin and I were pretty upset with that and, and looked it over. But there is a silver bullet, and it is walking. And it's the one thing people need to walk, 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 and then they need to walk some more. Um, I, I've been both thrilled with the embrace of the health issue, but a little worried because some of the things that are being proposed. I sat on a panel with someone who was building beautiful penthouses for very wealthy people and putting vitamin C in the showers and, um, and microban on the doorknobs, which particularly after the Academy IOM meeting on <laughs> uh, the microbiome certainly concerned a lot of us. Um, I actually think there's some very good mainstream work that's going on, and, and you're reflecting on it. And uh, the Urban Land Institute, and Sarah did not get up, so I will introduce her. Sarah Hammerschmidt is from the Urban Land Institute. They have done four major reports on building the business case for uh, walk healthy communities. Um, I love rule number one, put people first. And rule number five, make the healthy choice, the easy choice. And Sarah is now working on, the last one was around uh, the issue of um, empowerment, diverse and affordable housing in the, in the new developments. This is new thinking for a lot of the big developers is affordable housing. Sarah, you want to say, it's a way of introducing yourself and ULI's work to the group. Just say quickly what this next report that's coming out is. Yeah. Yeah, I think you need to, and introduce yourself as well. She is a doctoral student at the University of Texas as well. I do lots of things. Um, so yeah, as Dr. Jackson mentioned, we have a new um, report that's coming out that we're actually partnering with the Center for Active Design who did the active design guidelines that you mentioned. And it's targeted at developers, and it's providing um, it's a set of 21 strategies that they can start implementing into their development projects from the building scale to the community scale that actually have um, documented health improvements. We've, we've looked at the research in order to do that. So that'll be coming out in January or February. So that'll be something specifically targeted toward that community that should help as well. That's great. If I could just respond real quickly, I think something, uh, not surprisingly, Dr. Jackson has said something quite uh, profound and interesting and useful. I, I actually firmly agree with you that um, I actually think that one of the walkability is actually a metric we need to embrace but also study because I think it's the right kind of thing. Because um, uh, first of all, I think one of the things I've always loved about the way you frame these issues is that you, you emphasize the importance of design. Not just, this is not going to be just come down to sidewalk yes, no, or whatever. There's, there's design. And I think walk, what I like about walkability is that it doesn't turn off the designers um, as well because you're not overly constraining what, we're not going to get the same environment over and over and over. Because sometimes I think in a, when you go down an empirical or kind of a science way, you, you, it looks like you're going to have the same thing over and over. And we don't want that. But I think walkability, um, Works. I mean, I've heard one person. I've, if you haven't read it, I've been really. I like the way Jeff Speck uh, reframes it in his book *Walkable City*. He talks. He comes with the same conclusion. If you had to choose one metric, be walkability. My question to this group, going forward, it's I'm I'm struggling with it myself. What are the other big ones? It's going to be something like walkable. I don't know what they are perfectly yet, but they we need to capture some of the other domains um, as well. So I appreciate your talk. And, and the metaphor of the trains leaving the station, there's a lot of trains leaving the station all at the same time, some good trains, some bad trains. And one train that this group has been interested in has been bringing health into the sustainable development goal process and the idea of health metrics at a very macro scale. And so my question is, this is great, you know, th 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 not to deny this in any way, but is there, as we think about the health metrics for the real estate industry and, and at the building scale and everything, is there a way to think about how these get aggregated up uh, or there are, you know, kind of metrics connect to the kind of data that are available at the macro scale so that we can incorporate some of these ideas into very large scale economic development projects? Um, so that's a... That's a, big, that's a big vision, obviously, I share it. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the ways we've been working on, um, I'm starting to become convinced that one thing we, we're gonna have to focus on is perhaps um, 
what are breaking down like if, if we have an idea of like an index that one particular entity wants to use, I think what we're going to have to be careful of is that every group is probably going to want a slightly different index. Uh, so we want to really focus on interoperability. I think the cool opportunity that we are actually exploring for a group like U.S. Green Building Council, ULI, whatever it might be, um, is to perhaps get at what are the uh, kind of raw data or the open data. We've been kind of playing around with the idea of what are the vital signs um, that we might want to be capturing and keep them open. We actually had Brian Sivaka, the CTO, a chief technology officer of HHS at our talk thing today, and that's what he was kind of talking about. It's like, could there be a vision f going forward of an open data platform where <clears throat> you know, things like steps, uh, maybe pers interpersonal collisions at work, um, you know, air quality, whatever they are at that their core that are being collected in a more raw form at, but, uh, at scale, and then post-analysis can be brought together as they need to be. I don't know. We're working on it. Yes. Um, Al McCartland, EPA. So I work in a building now that was built during the Depression, and the stairwells are all kind of dark gray and, you know, not grungy, actually, or well-kept, but it's not a very inviting place. And it led me to think about your stairwells and things that are fantastic. And it, I'm a behavioral scientist, economist, but is there, are there behavioral scientists working on this with architects and with health scientists to sort of nudge people in this direction? <laughs> Do you know what's really exciting? Um, that was actually one of my most proud people. There's probably folks here in the federal government. Um, so when I, one of my most proud moments of that NIH workshop was that I, I was able to put like interior design onto a NIH, um, you know, workshop agenda and graphic design. I had graphic design and people, when it was just sitting there on the agenda, we were like, Matt, what's going on here? But as soon as we got there, it was basically. What's, what's interesting is that I think actually behavioral economics, uh, nudging, things like, sign, so when you get into it, signage, um, things like uh, interiors, that's actually probably some of the most ready to ship uh, evidence that we have around things like prompting healthy behavior choices and so forth. And um, so yeah, th that was actually one of the main points of, our, of the NIH workshop was to, we chose a school and we basically said, you're going to have to start thinking at multi-scales at the same moment, everything from the graphic design of the signage up to site, site selection for that school is going to be relevant going forward. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're going to need to transition to our next speaker uh, who only has limited available and he is available just on the phone, but we'll get back to the discussion um, at, at the end of the session. Thank you so much for having been able to join us and you're welcome to just stay as long as you can. Um, to come visit, to come visit um, us and GW as well. Um, so uh, Nicholas Freudenberg is on the phone, as from what I understand, and I've yeah. already introduced. Hi everybody. Hi everyone. I introduced you earlier, and so if you don't mind, um, I'd like to just kind of hand you the floor. We're hearing you really well, so take Good. take it from here. Good. 